This video is sponsored by Ridge Wallet. I am tired right now. Not necessarily because I didn't like Fishman Island, but because my schedule totally fell apart this week, resulting in me needing to read almost 60 chapters worth of story in a day and a half. And so, as I'm writing this, I am holding my eyes open at 1am after having read for what felt like a thousand years. Actually, you know what? I don't think I should be writing a script right now. I'm too tired. I'm going to continue this in the morning. Eight hours later. Ah, much better. And to be honest, I feel like I have a much more solid opinion of the story Fishman Island has to offer now. Last week, I dipped my toe back into reviewing the story of One Piece with the short but charming return to Shibaldi, which in a lot of ways acted as a setup arc of sorts for this fishy boy. And let me tell you, Fishman Island has a lot going on. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, I will explore in this episode. So, welcome back everyone. I'm Totally Not Mark, and these are my first impressions of, thoughts on, and review for, a tale 30,000 feet beneath the ocean surface, exploring personal prejudice, loyalty, and tenacity. This is the turbulent, the busy, and the foreboding Fishman Island. <laughs> Right, so before I dive into this one, I want to touch on a couple of things I neglected to mention last week. Return to Sabaudi was, in effect, the prelude to Fishman Island and without which wouldn't work nearly as well. It acts as the reintroduction to the entire crew who have all grown and changed considerably since we last saw them two years prior with full redesigns. Sanji's hair is brushed to the other side with some facial hair. Zoro most notably has a scar over his left eye, which I'm sure has a very interesting story behind it that I don't know yet. Chopper has remained largely the same aesthetically, with the biggest difference being that of his hat. Nami has aged up to become a grown woman. Usopp is buff now, with a little soul patch goatee thing. Robin's hair is different, pushed back, I'm not sure if I like it more or less, and no physical changes are obvious yet. Frankie is a massive upgraded mechanical man now, and Brooke is a superstar, which leaves Luffy whose biggest physical change comes in the form of an X-shaped scar across his torso, acting as a constant reminder of why it's so important for him to get stronger to protect those he loves. As a result of this love, as well as all the time they've spent training, the crew has literally never been stronger. Taking out pacifistas with relative ease, and speaking of which, Bartholomew Kuma, the real one, acting on its last shred of humanity, he protected the Thousand Sunny until Frankie arrived back at the archipelago. I don't know what this means for the future, but I'm interested to see how Dr. Vegapunk plays into future events. Overall, I think these redesigns are welcome and in many ways inform the changes the characters have undergone over the last two years. This being most evident with characters like Usopp and Zoro, whose physical changes echo the tribulations they underwent over the training period of the last two years. But with characters like Frankie and Robin, I'm not sure if I like these redesigns as much as the former, but who knows, they might grow on me. However, while keeping that in mind, if Fishman Island acts as anything, it's as a statement to the rest of the world that the Straw Hats are here and they are forced to be reckoned with. All right, enough teasing. And with a weird long-tongued creep pursuing them, the Straw Hats dive to the depths below, not knowing the adventure that awaits them. Speaking generally before diving into the story in greater detail, I actually really enjoyed this arc. It's by no means the best or even in the top five. I would say I got a little bit more enjoyment out of this arc than I did with Little Garden. Or perhaps the same. It doesn't do anything structurally different to the prior arcs of the story and does some things here and there that I didn't really enjoy so much that I will explore in greater detail later. But overall, I'm pretty happy I read it. It has some tender moments and I'd totally be down to read it again in the future sometime. Fishman Island is a story that finally explores the rich history of the area and its people that have since the very beginning of the story been ostracized and belittled for how they are. It's a story about prejudice and the means with which to combat that on both sides of this, which is a really interesting way of tackling the issue, I think. Now, with that said, I think it can be very heavy handed in parts, with certain characters devolving down to represent the extreme of a certain ideology's point of view. But overall, I think it offers more good than bad. So let's talk about the setup and how the story handles the first act. Something that immediately caught my eye, as I'm sure it did with many of your own when you first saw it, was Rayleigh's farewell to the Straw Hats as he watches them dive down to the depths below. Teary-eyed, he recalls the time when he first encountered Roger. Young and skinny, brimming with a large smile painted across his face, wearing a straw hat. He asked Rayleigh to join his crew, and the rest was history. But the fact that Roger has Luffy's hat, or has a hat similar to Luffy, has me thinking, that straw hat Roger was wearing, how did it come to be worn by Shanks? Okay, here's a theory. And it's a bold one. 
What if Shanks was the one to kill Roger? What if Shanks poisoned him? And the reason he went to look over Luffy was to keep tabs on him. By some mechanism, he knew that Luffy was the one. He knows now that Luffy is going to come all the way back to him to deliver the hat, and maybe Luffy growing into the person he is today is important for something he wants to achieve. He's an emperor of the sea, and he was the enemy of Whitebeard for some time. We know that Whitebeard's a good guy. Now, obviously, there needs to be a few more bits of setup and an explanation needs to be delivered upon, but I think this could be really cool. For the big bad and the hero of the story to have been established in the very first chapter without anyone really knowing, that would be awesome, but who knows? I could be completely wrong and probably am. Besides, I spent too long speculating, time to talk about fish stuff. The start of the story centers around the crew as they make their treacherous way towards Fishman Island. And you'd think that once they have the ship kitted out with diving qualities, that that would be the most difficult part. Well, it absolutely isn't. And this is one of the aspects of this arc, I think, work in its favor to set itself apart from the rest of the other arcs. This destination, Fishman Island, is the most treacherous out of all the others we've ever visited in the past. Just like the rest of the crew, we are experiencing all of this in real time as they dive 10,000, 20,000, and eventually 30,000 feet below sea level, where enormous Neptunians lurk and where light can't reach. And unlike the other arcs of One Piece that center around the exploration of a particular island, the journey to Fishman Island alone is just as action-packed and important as the activity that goes down once they do meet their destination. This brief but enthralling introduction to the depths of One Piece both informed the story that we are to explore later on, but also introduces us to the environment and a lot of the different mechanics we will have to contend with during this story. Like enormous mythical creatures and bubble suits that enable the likes of those with devil fruit abilities to navigate the water they're in. Which, by the way, I thought was introduced in an ingenious way, if I'm being perfectly honest. You see, something we've not had to contend with much in the series so far is air. Oxygen levels. In this story, it plays a massive role, specifically because it's in short supply a lot of the time in various scenes. For instance, the study that Raleigh coated has a membrane that can be permeated, but not to an extreme extent. Meaning one or two individuals can punch or slice through it, but if too many at once try, it won't end well. Which is a nice bit of added tension to the group's activity activities considering almost half of them are Devil Fruit users, which, by the way, offered a lot in the way of an opportunity for Luffy to demonstrate his character perfectly. Throughout the treacherous journey down through the depths of the sea, further and further the crew encounter numerous obstacles and beasts they need to flee from. And thankfully, they can, using the Sunny, but the drawback is that it uses oxygen. Which, I mean, on its own is sort of cool to create tension, but it gets compounded when the situation worsens, leading to them all running out of oxygen on the Sunny when they needed to make a split decision of whether to run away or to keep the air. But the interesting part is, at no point does Luffy waver. He has limitless resolve and belief in his crew. I mean, if there was ever a moment where the Devil Fruit user would be feeling the pressure, it's right there. Surrounded by water, thousands and thousands of feet beneath the surface, with only your crew to rely on. But Luffy never stresses, and I think that's why he's so carefree. It's not because he thinks he has everything under control, it's that he trusts his crew unconditionally, and together he knows that between them, there's always a solution that can be found. I mean, he insists on befriending the literal Kraken in the middle of the ocean, 20,000 feet beneath the surface. How insane is that? Something also I should bring up is that early on, it's brought to our attention that this creep we last saw at Sabaudi is pursuing them. However, through unfortunate circumstances for him, he gets captured by the Straw Hats and separated from his own crew. Uh, make sure to remember him, he becomes very important later. They also see the Flying Dutchman ship on the way down, which becomes important later also. But needless to say, they arrive on Fishman Island, which, by the way, given the nature of its inhabitants, is a really weird name for a place. It's like all of us calling our own respective hometowns Humanburg or something. Then again, maybe One Piece has really weird place names. I mean, Usopp is from Syrup Village, so it checks out. But back to the story. What I like about the introduction here also, when they arrive on the island, is the struggle there is to actually land the damn ship. It acts as a way of introducing us to all the issues that navigating in 3D space instead of sailing on the sea involves. In this place, they are surrounded by water, and once they do land where they want to be, they are unfortunately submerged underwater in the ocean, which is a big problem, but thankfully... Acting as a nice reintroduction for the character in the series, as well as offering the story an individual to give us natural exposition for the world of Fishman Island and what's going on there and then. So. Let's talk about the big bloody-nosed elephant in the room. 
人魚たちをエロい目で見て死にたい最低か I actually didn't mind Sanji in this arc. I know that sounds sort of contradictory, and I don't find it really remotely interesting, but it is what it is. I don't actively dislike it like I did the Absalon scene from Thriller Bark. In that, Sanji acted sort of like a creep, whereas here, albeit to a ridiculous extreme, all he's really doing is finding people attractive, and that's totally fine. He always did that, but what is funny about this to me is that it's used as a mechanism to give the crew a short term goal to. Drive the plot forward. Sanji was deprived of seeing people he found attractive for so long that now the mere sight of an attractive girl sends him flying into the sky propelled by his own nosebleed. Yes. That is a sentence I just said right now. This is literally the only anime I know where the lustful nosebleed actually has ramifications in the real story, which is honestly kind of funny. Regardless, this creates the circumstances wherein, along with certain stresses imposed by a sneak attack from the Fishman pirates, the Straw Hats need to escape and find Sanji a suitable blood transfusion, which apparently requires a rare blood type because Sanji's blood type is rare. As viewers and readers, this introductory scuffle informs us of three things. Sanji is a hopeless case. Luffy has gotten monstrously powerful, and the laws of Fishman Island are colored by their history. This particular circumstance, while it does meet a swift solution, it also shines a light on the two main themes of this story prejudice and forgiveness. Two themes that I find incredibly compelling personally, as I identify these as particular story topics that are timeless. Also, while fleeing the scene where they landed at the Mermaid Inlet, they encounter and ultimately run from the princes of Fishman Island, who happen to have been pursuing the Straw Hats with the goal of relaying to them a message from Jinbei, who's waiting for them at the forest of the sea. They also want him to know that he should not fight a person by the name of Hoddy. And that's not even to mention this character called Madame Charlie, the boss of the Mermaid Cafe where Kami works. This was the place they settled on to give Sanji his blood transfusion. She has the ability to predict the future using her crystal ball, and this very vision she has. Brings about the end of Fishman Island and the person responsible she identifies as Straw Hat Luffy. And, okay, this is what I think was the most jarring part of Fishman Island. Because it's picking up right after a break in the series with very little build up from the arc prior, it felt like I was being bombarded with dozens of new characters. And it felt that way because I was. Remember when I said in a prior video that at the beginning of these volumes I'm reading, there's a couple of pages dedicated at the start to keep you up to date with the relationships established in the story, who people are and who they are allied with. Remember that? Okay, well, this is what the second volume of this story shows us. Wanna guess how many people I have to keep track of? I'll give you a hint, it's 31. That's a lot to remember for little old me, and as someone who needs to keep track of the story's moving parts in order to review their success and failings, I found it almost overwhelming early on. With that said, however, this does improve greatly as Oda streamlines the story relatively quick after this. Having spent the first arc establishing a lot of the characters in the story, explaining and demonstrating how the world of Fishman Island works through wildlife, cultures, belief systems, citizens, as well as its technology and infrastructure, this arc, if nothing else, is ambitious in its telling. So let's see how the story starts to connect the dots and picks up from this point. It's at this point the main plot thread starts to take a hold of the story. We're introduced to and get to know two important antagonistic characters for the arc Hottie Jones, captain of the new Fishman Pirates, and Vander Danken, captain of the Flying Pirates and the Flying Dutchman ship, which we saw towards the beginning of the story. Both of these characters, effectively in one form or another, threaten to corrupt and tear the island itself apart. As villains go, I didn't personally find them too interesting on an individual level, and they certainly lack the same level of charisma other older characters like Arlong and Crocodile. I'll hat. But that's not to say that either of them don't have anything to offer the story. Vander Decken is a crucial plot device that allows the story itself to function as smoothly as it does, possessing a devil fruit ability that allows him to, once he touches someone, to throw anything towards them without missing. Now, that sounds rather unremarkable when set alongside other more flashy abilities, but it's this very power that holds the foundations of the plot together that I will get into a little more later on. On the personality front, Decken is more akin to a comedic sideshow attract. By no means, The main force of the arc and resembles something out of the wacky races cartoon more than an imposing villain. Now, Hottie Jones, on the other hand, I really enjoyed, but I should preface that by saying that I think if he had been used in any other setting or story, he would have been a ludicrously boring character. Which is to say that he works extremely well for this particular story and this story alone. And this is.
is made all the more evident by how he turns out at the very end of this arc. The reason why Hattie Jones serves this story so well comes down to what the story is trying to achieve. As this tale unravels, it comes more and more to the forefront of the narrative that racism and prejudice are at the core of this story. And a fantastic way of exploring these oftentimes complex concepts is by pitting two extreme versions of the ideology spectrum against each other. Hattie Jones is one of those extremes representing racism and hatred in its purest forms. In Arlong Park, we got some minor exposition regarding his feelings on human fishman relations, but it was by no means the main topic of the story. This time, it is, and Hottie acts as a terrific tool to communicate one side's feelings on the topic. And once Luffy and the crew meet the royal family of the kingdom, but most notably the princess, they become, as they often do, caught up in the complex turmoil the fishman people find themselves embroiled within. As I said, Luffy, Usopp, and Nami are taken to the palace by King Neptune, where Luffy meets Princess Shirahoshi, an enormous mermaid that has been locked away in her room for 10 years, hiding from one Vanderdecken who relentlessly throws lethal weapons and projectiles towards her from a very far distance in an effort to kill her for not agreeing to marry him. Now, naturally, when she meets Luffy, she is initially reluctant to trust him at all. Oh, and as a quick aside, this particular arc is filled with moments where someone asks Luffy to prove himself, but he never once tries to convince anyone of anything. He is who he is and he always lets his actions speak for themselves. He won't apologize for who he is and in this particular story where many fishmen judge humans and humans judge fishmen, it's a really powerful use of Luffy's character to fit and contribute to this particular story. And once he successfully protects the princess from an oncoming projectile, she feels safe enough to leave her tower to explore the wider world with him for the first time in a decade. Which again, highlights Luffy's character as someone who no matter how significant or powerful he is, will have no issue finding the time for a single individual if they so need it. Also, she sneaks out inside her pet shark Megala, who's an absolute trooper in this story, by the way. However, once her identity is eventually let slip and she slides out of the shark's mouth, for all the public to see, they are forced to flee with her to the forest of the sea, where the most significant side of the arc takes place. It's at this location Luffy happens to find and meet up with Jinbei who was waiting specifically for Luffy here. If you recall towards the beginning of the story, he was the one who had sent the three princes to relay a message to Luffy. That message was to go to the forest of the sea to meet with him and to not fight Hottie Jones. Good thing he managed to get there without ever receiving the message. Now, it's here we're greeted with a flashback and perhaps the best part of the story really. For hundreds of chapters now, the history of these people and the hardships they faced have been drip fed to us, which obviously creates anticipation but also offers these flashbacks a strength the rest of the story doesn't really have much of, which is build up. We want to know about Arlong's origins, we want to learn about Fisher Tiger, and we really want to learn about the Queen's story, who is held in incredibly high regard within this society after dying tragically young. So let's talk about the flashback. <laughs> This video is brought to you by Ridge.com slash TNM. Most people are still using wallets designed in the 1990s and in this modern landscape, it's seriously outdated. And I should know. I've been using the same wallet since I was 15 years old and that means I've been using some outdated wallet for the last 14 years of my life. In the same way phones have gotten more practical and compact over the last few decades, so too have wallets and it's honestly made a massive difference to my pockets. Personally, I hate having cumbersome items in there and this totally fits my new lifestyle. It holds up to 12 separate cards, plus room for cash, and there's over 30 different colors and styles, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium to choose from. And if that wasn't enough to win you over yet, check out their 30,000 five-star reviews. The durable nature of each of these wallets comes with a lifetime warranty, so in theory, you could buy this one wallet and carry it for life. And the Ridge team have told me that they're so confident that you like it that they'll actually let you test drive it for 45 days. That means you can send it back for a full refund if it's not up to your own standards. Right now, there's a special offer going where you can get 10% off with free worldwide shipping and returns. And you can get all of this by going to ridge.com slash TNM and using the coupon code TNM. Link is in the description. Kaya, please listen. Miss Kaya, has he harmed you? The best thing about this flashback is that it makes the entire climax of the arc far more interesting, which is exactly what a great flashback ought to do. Recontextualize the story in a more interesting way while exploring and extrapolating from the core themes of this narrative, providing more depth 
and intrigue. These flashbacks cover many years of struggle from various points of view, including but not limited to Hottie Jones as a kid, Vander Decken, Fisher Tiger, Jimbei and Arlong working beneath Fisher Tiger as young men before both defecting and the royal family to name but a few, primarily following the history of Queen Atahime. Something of note also is that I thought her design being that of a goldfish was inspired. The goldfish in Japan symbolizes prosperity and children, which is fitting as this character's ultimate goal is to free the future generations of this cycle of hatred her people have found themselves to be trapped in. I found her character to be charming and incredibly sweet, highlighted during a specific series of events surrounding the sudden arrival of a celestial dragon, demanding this and that of these people he deemed to be far beneath them. You know, typical likable celestial dragon stuff. Of the entire crowd formed around him, Otohime is the only one who shows any ounce of compassion and in a selfless act that embodies her belief perfectly, she jumps in front of this despicable human being to protect him from a gunshot. The character of Orihime is crucial to the overall message of this story, as she embodies the overall goal being that of forgiveness. But as I said, she isn't the only individual we see color the pages of these flashbacks, and between Fisher Tiger and the young Jinbei and Arlong, Hottie Jones is exposed to some horrid ideas from a very young age, ultimately leading him to carry this hatred for no reason at all. Hottie is the example of what Arahime was trying to avoid, to fight against, to prevent the next generation from inheriting the hatred of the past. And I thought that was covered really well throughout this entire arc, to be honest. Especially considering the one who ultimately killed Arahime is Hadi, as she is to him, standing in the way of progress for his race of people. After these flashbacks, another compelling set of conversations take place. My two favorites of the arc. The first being that of Nami, reconciling the fact that Jinbei was responsible for her time under Arlong, ultimately releasing him into the East Blue in the first place, ending with her ultimately forgiving him for that. But the second is by far the most interesting for me. It's the debate that takes place between Jinbei and Luffy after these flashbacks end, regarding what's the next step in solving this Hottie Jones matter. I thought this was genius, and offered a very unique flavor to the dialogue I hadn't felt really since Water 7 with Usopp. Both sides of this conversation have their points. Luffy wants to take out this murdering racist that wants to bring about destruction and widespread hatred, but Jinbei says quite rightly that that will do more bad than good, as it will be yet another instance of humans being cruel to fishmen, turning Hadi himself into a martyr, which is a really fascinating angle to take this complex situation from. It's a surprisingly easy to understand nuanced point of view that stands completely at odds with Luffy's way of thinking. And so from that, the new goal becomes how do they control the optics of the situation? How do they turn Luffy into Fishman Island's hero? Act 3. This act, much like the rest of the arc, isn't concerned primarily with plot, but more so the individual elements contributing to and expanding upon the given themes of the arc itself. Does it work 100%? Yes and no. On a thematic level, I think it works perfectly fine. But from a plot point of view, a lot of the characters who interact in this arc feel less like characters, but more like stand-ins or vehicles to deliver an idea specifically for the arc and its themes. For instance, Hottie Jones, as I said, represents what could happen. He represents what happens when you don't encourage the next generation to forgive. He even goes as far as to kill his own kind to meet his ends, and even manages to get his hands on a pill that amplifies his power in exchange for time off of his life. And throughout the arc, right up until the end, and Hotty Jones changes from a youthful, strong fishman to a withered bigot, with his hatred being the direct cause for his loss of life, his own hatred having taken his own freedom and youth from him. He is by no means a complex character, but again, an example to show everyone what can happen if the thematic message isn't successful. Because he's not much of a character and only conceived for this arc, he gets locked away at the end at a really old age. So I would be really surprised if he ever shows up again. And I'm sorry if it feels like I'm glancing over stuff, but trust me, I have understood and appreciated everything I've read here. It's just because the story really only has one main plot thread active at any given time, there's so many things that have to be explained in a single storyline. Like, I didn't even really talk about Hottie's backstory, or Fisher Tiger's story, or Arlong's origins, or Van Der Decken's history with the Flying Dutchman. And the reason is, is if I did all of it, it would just be recapping, and this video would be like two hours long. Fishman Island feels so dense specifically because it only has one plot plot thread from start to finish, and from a structural standpoint, that's its biggest difference between all the other arcs, who always had other interconnecting plot threads at any given time. So for the sake of my mind and your time, you can rest assured that I thoroughly enjoyed that flashback for Fisher Tiger and all the rest of them. 
and from this point on, I'm gonna pick up right where Jinbei, Megalo, and Princess Shirahoshi show up to confront Hadi in the public square after he delivers a pretty character-rich speech to the citizens of Fishman Island. And for context, narratively, this also takes place right after Luffy and Jinbei had that argument over how best to deal with this situation they're facing tactfully. Flanked by 100,000 pirates backing his cause stands Hadi, now with a head full of withering white hair and a massively different body, the results of his desire to indulge in this power pill, this is where the story finally starts getting into some decent action. Madame Charlie, the fortune teller, steps forth from the crowd that has ultimately turned on Hadi Jones after his speech, revealing to the crowd what she knows about Straw Hat Luffy, which quickly brings the crowd into chanting for Luffy to come and take care of Hadi. Hadi has now become so monstrous that even the fishmen that are unsure of the human race in general are cheering against him. And with various chants for Luffy echoing throughout the area, out from Megalo's stomach flies Luffy, landing a massive attack on Hadi who's sent flying. Springing forth, standing alongside their captain, stand the rest of the Straw Hat crew. They aren't interested in changing the minds of or convincing anyone of anything and this is our first chance to see how powerful they really have become. And this fight is actually really tense, starting with something massively impressive. Luffy takes out half of the army, 50,000 people with his haki alone, with the rest of the Straw Hats left to deal with the remaining 50,000. From this very section, the part that stayed with me the most as a striking visual was the moment Luffy walks casually through the hurricane of a battle raging on before him, unafraid and undeterred straight towards Hadi, allowing his crew to clear the path toward him. It's a powerful moment demonstrating that Luffy has changed a considerable amount over the last two years. He is now a force to be reckoned with. And to be honest, Luffy is way too powerful in this instance for Hadi to prove to be a threat even in the slightest. Which is why Oda makes use of the technology established at the beginning of this story. And thus enter Vanderdecken to inject some ridiculous stakes, circumstances, and set pieces. The dude throws a massive arc called Noah that has massive significance which I'll speak on later, but anyway, he throws the giant arc causing it to follow like all the other projectiles towards the princess. Meaning it will crash into Fishman Island if she doesn't move. Which means now she has to flee the island and begin swimming up into the area where Luffy can't protect her. And thus arise the perfect circumstances for a handicapped fight between Luffy and Hadi, now both in pursuit of the boat. Hadi mortally wounds and takes out Deccan for attempting to thwart his planet. As a result, now the ship begins to plummet to the island below. Luffy, in this time aided by the bubble technology and the princes from before, take out Hadi once and for all in an incredibly cathartic way. But this still doesn't resolve the circumstances. The massive ship is still on a collision course falling towards the island below. Now, I didn't mention this before, but in the flashback, which I did a terrible job of explaining, it reveals the key piece of information that led to Vanderdeck in pursuing the princess for the last 10 years in the first place. It's her ability to communicate with the Neptunians, a gift that is granted to maybe one individual every few centuries. Which is a massive deal, considering how enormous the Neptunians are in this particular section, but moreover, in this instance, full of distress and worry for her people and her island, while Luffy is doing everything he can to destroy the ship before it lands, she screams for him to stop. This ship is important for her people and carries a tremendous significance, but also, there's now no need anymore. Having not known how to control this power or that she even had it, she manages to pull off this right at the last second. And at the very end of this battle, Luffy, much like Fisher Tiger was in his story, is left lifeless after a savage encounter, in desperate need of a blood transfusion. However, as it was established in the beginning of the story, giving blood to a human is forbidden by law. And at the same time, throughout this story, Jinbei has been an incredibly compelling character to follow as he offered the story a ton of internal conflict. Raised to resent the society that put his people into slavery, even after Fisher Tiger's passing, he still held on to both resentment and shame for what his actions wrought. However, Jinbei, in this moment with Luffy, decides to not hold on to anger and gives Luffy his blood. Again, I didn't mention this earlier, but during those flashback sequences, we saw how Fisher Tiger came to die. It was his decision to not accept the blood transfusion of a human. He held on to hatred and thus died as a direct result of it. A blood transfusion acting as a powerful example that we are all made of the exact same stuff on the inside. That focusing on the outside is what brought slavery about in the first place and what ultimately brought about his own demise. And reflecting on that, Jinbei acts as an example for the older generations too, that you as well as the next generation do not need to continue this awful result. And what makes this story even more nuanced is that Oda accepts that there are those that will never be able to feel like they can forgive. And that can be okay too, as long as you don't instill this resentment in the next generation. 
And to be honest, I think that's a really powerful message for a story. I mean, as many of you might already know, I'm Irish. I've lived in Ireland my entire life and in doing so, I've become aware of Ireland's turbulent past with the British Empire in England. And while relations between Ireland and the British Empire are relatively great right now, all things considered regarding our history, there are still Irish alive today that despise the British for the past that we share. And perhaps it's because of my upbringing, but I really appreciated the angle that this arc took when discussing prejudice and forgiveness. Oftentimes during these stories, a massive amount of focus is put on the racism side of the argument. And that's because it's the obvious target and makes for compelling force to fight against. And it goes without saying that it absolutely 100% is a force that should be fought against. But in these circumstances, situations are rarely cut and dry, especially if you extrapolate over a number of generations. And the fact is, is that these circumstances will continue to affect every subsequent generation until both sides reach an eventual understanding. And I love that this story took the time to focus on the forgiveness side of the argument, as it is, in my opinion, the single most important and fascinating part to explore within a story. If I were to hold English people my age responsible for the sins of their great grandparents, or entire country for that matter, then all I'm doing is perpetuating this horrific toxic mentality to future generations to suffer through, full of resentment and hatred, which not only isn't fair to them and the English, but also doesn't make any logical sense. In Fishman Island, they explore all of that with the character of Arahime acting as the polar opposite to Hottie Jones. Her character effectively holds up a mirror to us, the audience, and her people for them and us all to see how ugly they are becoming. And as I mentioned, the stark contrast to Hottie Jones, the product of a hateful ideology, proving that if you follow this resentment far enough, you become exactly what you hate, a prejudiced maniac obsessed with his own race. Fishman Island and Hottie Jones's character tells a story of how choosing hatred over forgiveness can lead to your own self-destruction, both on an emotional and physical level. This is on display throughout the entire story, but my favorite similarity I noticed was that of Nami and the former Fishman slaves. Just like the former slaves of Fishman Island, who morphed their own tattoos to represent something else that they believe in, so too did Nami change her Arlong Pyrus tattoo to something else. Effectively, Arlong did the exact same thing to the humans that he despised them for, reinforcing the notion that if you let the hatred consume you, you start to become exactly what you hate. Now, before I wrap things up with this review, I'd like to break down all the interesting pieces of information and lore that were revealed during this arc first. And what comes to mind immediately is the significance of the ultimate weapon finally being revealed. Way back in Skypea, coordinates pointed to this exact destination, and only now is it being explored and uncovered. That's mad. There's also this really interesting moment where Luffy asks Jinbei right after he saves his life to join the Straw Hat crew. And while he doesn't immediately accept Luffy's offer due to his own need to take care of some certain businesses he needs to attend to, I think it's a really nice little thing left for us to look forward to in the story, whenever it does end up happening, that is. Personally, I think Jinbei is a perfect addition to the Straw Hat crew. Also, I didn't mention it during this arc, but Robin wandered off to uncover a poneglyph in her own sort of side story, effectively disconnected from the rest of it until the the very, very end. And on this particular poneglyph read an apology from one Joy Boy, who was revealed to have been someone that lived during the Void Century 800 years ago. Apparently he broke a promise to the Fishmen, but they don't remember what it was for. This is obviously super important and I'm sure it will be explained later, but as of right now, I have no idea what to make of it. Oh, also, when the princess communicated to the Neptunians, Luffy understood what was being said. That's massive! And I'm guessing, based off of the brief flashback we got of this exact situation happening with Roger, hearing the Neptunians, is that Roger didn't know that he had this power. The fact that Luffy could come to learn the fact that he has this power could be a game changer when it comes to correcting history and revealing the Void Century. In other news, Akainu, the guy who yeeted Ace out of the picture, is now the new fleet admiral instead of Aokiji who was put forward by Sengoku. And apparently Aokiji has now left the navy. Additionally, Luffy started a mad beef with Big Mom, one of the four or emperors of the sea and in an effort to make amends also sent her a bomb by mistake which is hilarious if this video alone hasn't conveyed to you how insane and detailed this particular arc is i encourage you to check it out for yourself I personally very much enjoyed it, and I can sort of feel how things are building to something significant yet again, and I cannot wait to see what's to come for us in this series. But with a farewell pinky promise, I gotta say that this is the end of the video. As always, I've been Totally Not Mark, I'll see you all next week, and thank you so much for watching.